You got to be intentional and deliberate. John chapter 4, out of that whole chapter where Jesus meets the woman at the well, my favorite verse is verse 4, and it says, And he must needs go to Samaria. It's just a simple verse, but it's so full of intentionality and being deliberate. Jesus had, a, he was on a mission. He had a divine appointment, and he goes, And he must needs go to Samaria. And you want Bible study context? We have to be intentional and deliberate about these things. Now, I know it can be intimidating to ask someone if they want Bible studies. I might have shared this before when my patient texted me. One of the best text messages I ever got. Hey, I just want to let you know how thankful I am for you. I said yes to a Bible study and it changed my life. Thank you. What if I hadn't asked him if he wanted Bible studies? I would have missed the opportunity to help change his life. 25 year old male patient. But I want to underscore, remember, do not ask people if they want Bible studies if you haven't won their confidence first. Hello, sir. Remember? Hello, Jesus Pastor. How are you? Happy New Year. Um, happy New Year, man. Welcome, man. Hey, I'm so thankful that you're doing this, uh, Calvin. And I meant to tell you, we haven't spoken, but your last presentation was really, really, really powerful. Oh, praise the Lord. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I just remember our army camps and, you know, you were always up front, just kind of opening up. Uh, but to see you doing what you're doing now was amazing, man. Oh, and Scott, sharing Scott. what you're saying now is amazing. Praise the Lord. Praise God. And hello, everyone. Uh, glad to have you all on, and I'm glad you all have been enjoying Calvin and what he's been presenting. So um, uh, I know that what you'll share tonight will be will be powerful as well, man. So uh, I'm going to turn it over to you. I don't know if Gigi, I know she is... Or do you have slides you're going to be sharing? No, I just have one picture I wanted to share. That's it. So I sent it to her and she said she can pop it up right when I need it. And that's it. All right. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. I'm looking. She is not on yet, but she just contacted me. So, um, but I'll let you go ahead, man, and, and, and open up with prayer and you can go ahead and start and I'll go on mute. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, I like interaction. So feel free. Put stuff in the chat box in the comments and um, feel free. We'll engage. So let's begin with prayer. If you bow your heads with prayer for me, with, with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you, Lord, for life and for health, for carrying us through another year. And as we go forth in this new year, I'm excited to present on this topic of how to give Bible studies because um, we have a new year. And I'm hoping that many will take on this challenge that um, they'd want to, perhaps, for those who've never given a Bible study, maybe they would want to do their first Bible study. And so I just ask that I would be a conduit for your Holy Spirit to speak through and that we would hear a word from heaven as we dwell into this most important topic. Pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. All right. It says, um, okay, Gigi's here. Wonderful. All right, Gigi, when I tell you to put up the picture, I'll let you know when. I'll, I'll give you the cue. So, one of my favorite topics to talk about is soul winning. And from time to time, when I go to churches and I talk about this, I will have people, well-meaning people come up to me and tell me that they've never given a Bible study before. So if you have never given a Bible study, don't be, don't, don't feel like you, you know, don't be embarrassed. Don't feel like you are inadequate because this is very common. I would, my guess would be that the majority of Seventh-day Adventists, that there's more Seventh-day Adventists who haven't given a Bible study then there are those who have given a Bible study. And I can totally understand if you haven't given one that it can be intimidating and daunting. But I want to tell you how easy it is. I was headed to Daystar Academy on a mission trip, and I was in charge of this. And I asked a friend of mine, Michelle, to give one of the worship talks in the morning. And she shared a simple story. She's a nurse, and she works with patients who have muscular dystrophy. And she somehow she became friends with them and they asked for Bible studies and she'd never given a Bible study before. What would you do? So she took two of her patients who have muscular dystrophy and their mother and another family member. So there's four total and just took the amazing fact study guides and went through each one of them, read the question, read the answer, read the question, read the answer. And when they had finished all 26 of those, slides, all four oh. of them, committed to baptism 
and they became baptized into our church. And as she shared this, it was so moving. And she said, if you can read, you can give a Bible study. And I know that every single one of you can read. <laughs> now, just last month, I was asked to be in their wedding as one of the groomsmen. And at the wedding, as during the rehearsal night, I see these two beautiful girls in a wheelchair. And they were the flower girls. And I thought to myself, these two lovely ladies must be two of the people that she gave Bible studies to. So later on, I asked them, I said, how do you know Michelle? And they smiled and they said, Michelle gave us Bible studies and we all got baptized. And now they're part of our Seventh-day Adventist church family. And Gigi, can you put up that picture for me, please? So of course I had to ask, can I take a picture with you guys? And tonight I won't be using any PowerPoint. This is the only picture that I wanted to share. And so if possible, if it comes up, let's see. I see it at the bottom. Yeah. And these are the two beautiful, lovely ladies. You can see them. They're in their specialized wheelchairs. And um, I just imagine that when we get to heaven, that it will be those who are crippled, those who are maimed, the blind, those who are challenged, had the greatest challenges in this life, that will love Jesus the most. And maybe perhaps they might be the first ones to enter in through the pearly gates of heaven. And so because of Michelle's, thank you so much, and you can take that off. Thank you. Because of Michelle's beautiful testimony, I often share what she shared. If you can read, you can give a Bible study. However, I no longer can say this because I have a friend, and you know what he does? He gives lots of Bible studies, and for some people, what he does is he just drops Bible studies off at their home. And every week, he comes back and drops off the next study guide. So technically, even if you can't read, and I'm sure all of you can, you can still give a Bible study. Now, when Pastor Ivers approached me a couple months ago about doing this series, one of the topics was not how to give a Bible studies. It was specifically how to share doctrines. And I said, I'll take that one. Now, what are doctrines? Doctrines are in the most simplest sense, what a church teaches or they're just church teachings. The word comes from the Latin doctor or teacher. So think of a doctrine as the teachings of a school religion or political group. It is how we as a church interpret scripture. So for example, if you went to a Pentecostal church, they would have different doctrines from our Seventh-day Adventist church because they interpret scripture differently. Today, people don't like this word doctrines. It's not a word that's in vogue today. They feel that it's doctrines that's something that causes divisions among us. Because truly, what's the difference between us and Catholics? It's really our church doctrines. It's the way we interpret things. And this is what separates us from the Baptists, from the Mormons, from the Methodists, Evangelicals, and from all the other um, different Christian uh, religions. Now, we have one Bible, and yet, do you know how many different denominations we have here just in the United States? We have over 200 different denominations. You guys, it's a jungle out there. Do you know how many different denominations there are worldwide? I looked on Google, over 45,000 globally. Just think about that. We have one Bible, and yet this is how, how varied it is on how it is interpreted. Now, in the early church, Satan used persecution. We've all heard of the stories of in the Roman Colosseums, they would put Christians in there with the lions to tear them apart. You know what happens when you persecute Christians? The answer is given in the great controversy. Christians only become stronger and more ardent and fervor. Their fervor grows in their faith when you persecute them. So Satan's smart and he realized, you know what? This is not really working. So Satan's like, you know what? If you can't beat them, what do you do? Join them. And so Satan just came up with all kinds of different flavors of churches, a flavor, different strokes for different folks in here. And you know what? It was brilliant and it's worked. See, if you've got a church that says Church of Satan, nobody, the majority of us aren't going to go to that church. There are some people who are looking for a satanic church, but most of us aren't going to go. But if you disguise it and it's teaching 90% truth and just 10% error, it's all you need. 
and I'm sure you guys have heard this whole scenario before. If you got a milk carton, vitamin D, calcium, milk, it does a body good. Everyone will drink the milk. You got a bottle of cyanide, no one's going to drink it. But all you need is just one drop of cyanide or arsenic in that bottle of milk, and everyone's going to drink it because they think it's harmless. And so this is basically what Satan's doing, and it's been working amazingly. Now, I want to share a quick story before I get into this that a pastor shared, and it's, this story always stuck with me. You've all heard of promise keepers. They were a, in a lot, it was a lot more prominent probably about 20 years ago. Anyways, promise keepers was all about getting Christian men to be men of integrity coming together. And, you know, they would meet in these stadiums. So could you imagine being in a stadium with tens of thousands of other Christian men? Just imagine the energy that would be in that stadium. And he tells a story of how someone goes up, was up in the front, and they said, on the count of three, I want you to yell out your denomination. One, two, three. Could you just imagine everyone saying, Baptist, Methodist, Catholic, Seventh-day Adventist. Just, it just sounded like gibberish. Then he said, on the count of three, I want everyone to shout out, who are we saved by? One, two, three. Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, could you imagine a stadium with like 10,000 men? I don't even know how many thousands of men. Everyone together. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Now, the whole thing sounds beautiful, doesn't it? It may sound beautiful, but see what it's doing is one of the one of the one of the promises of the promise keepers, and this is number seven, is a promise keeper is committed to reaching beyond any racial, denominational, generational, and cultural cultural barriers to demonstrate the power of biblical unity. On the surface, it sounds beautiful, right? But you and I, we have the inside scoop on what's going to happen at the end. We know that there's going to be an ecumenical movement. We know what they're striving to do is bring everyone together. Who are going to be the ones that are the outliers, the ones who are causing the problem, the ones who choose to be different? Or we may look divisive to everybody. It will be us Seventh-day Adventists. We will look like the troublemakers. And what is it? It's our doctrines. Because we're going to hold true to our doctrines. That's why it's important to understand why doctrines are important and that we have special truths. Did we come up and make up these doctrines? Who gave us these doctrines? Jesus gave us these doctrines. These are the teachings that Jesus has given to us. Now, all different churches have their own creeds and their doctrines and teachings. There are only two churches who have doctrines that are cohesive, coherent, sync together, and fit perfectly together. Can someone type in the chat box, which, what are the two churches? that have teachings that completely fit together and are coherent. Any guesses? There's just two churches. One is the Catholic Church. Can anyone guess what the other church is? It's the Seventh-day Adventist Church. My wife grew up Presbyterian. When she started learning about Seventh-day Adventist Church, you know what she said? It made so much sense. It answered and cleared up so many questions that she had. When you start looking into the doctrines of a lot of these different churches, there are a lot of loose ends that don't fit together. But if you really look into the Catholic teachings and the doctrines, it fits together amazingly well. Now, it's based on a, false, a faulty premise. That's the thing. Who gave the beast its power? Revelation 13 tells us the dragon gave its power, right? So Satan's behind this church, and so he's crafted church teachings that fit amazingly well together. The problem is it's based on error. We, as a Seventh-day Adventist church, our doctrines, our understanding, our interpretation of Scripture is coherent and cohesive because, because it's God who gave us these teachings. Okay? So anyways, um, because of Satan's successful strategy— most people in this world, including many Bible-believing Christians, have a very distorted view of who God is. When I give Bible studies to someone who has a Catholic background, they have an image of a very wrathful and vengeful God. And this is very common, and it depends on what denomination, but people have a distorted view, and Satan, Satan is behind all this. 
And every time you and I share doctrines or put it simply, sharing doctrines is just giving Bible studies. When you and I are giving Bible studies with others, you and I have an amazing opportunity to share the truth about who God really is. That the creator God of our universe is loving, he is merciful, he's just, and not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So I'm going to just start out and just give you the ABCs of how to give a Bible study. Now, I want you to know that I'm a dentist. I never went to any Bible college. I don't have any theological training. Just putting that out there, being very transparent. I'm just one beggar showing a bunch of other beggars where to find food. There's a saying that goes like this. Do you know, do you know what's the difference between a beginner snowboarder and a snowboard instructor? The answer, just four days. If you know how to snowboard, you can teach somebody else to snowboard. Same thing with the Bible. You only need to know one thing more than the person that you're, you're studying with. And by virtue of being a Seventh-day Adventist, if you grew up reading Uncle Arthur's Maxwell's Blue Bible Story books, I will tell you, you already know way more about the Bible than your average Christian does. I was giving Bible studies to my staff. I have six staff. Two are already Christians. And they're pretty serious Christians. They're, they're active. They're, they're uh, you know, passionate about what they do at their church. We were going to study something about King Solomon. I said, what do you know about King Solomon? They couldn't tell me anything about King Solomon. I am sure that every single one of you could tell me that he was the wisest man who ever lived. I'm sure all of you guys could tell me who his father was. Now, if you don't know those two things, then you really need to study the Bible yourself. But I'm guessing every Seventh-day Adventist would know those two things. So just by virtue of being a Seventh-day Adventist, most of us know much more about the Bible. Now, there are so many things to share that I want to share. So I'm going to sh start with some of the things that I think are most important. What is the best topic to begin with for when you give a Bible study? I make it a point in general not to present anything in the first two to three Bible study that disagrees or discredits what my Bible study contact may believe. Now, I think I shared this story. I may not have shared it, but, it, but I shared this. I think I shared the story on a previous presentation where I had a patient who agreed to do Bible studies. They came in with her. She came in with her husband. I'm excited. And I wanted to hit her with a topic that was going to be so good that she's going to want, she's going to be begging for more Bible studies. And the reason why I picked the topic was the topic of hell is because I had listened to a speaker on Audioverse talking about what an incredible teaching this is and how we understand it. Isn't that beautiful that we know the truth that you don't burn forever and ever? So if I'm in heaven and my beautiful daughter is not, she's not being tortured forever and ever. She's, she's put to sleep. And it paints a very beautiful picture of a loving God. So here I'm passionate about this topic and I'm sharing this. And halfway through, she asks me, what denomination are you? She looks, like, she looks at me like I'm nuts. And she would not stop until I finally told her what denomination I was. And she never came back for another Bible study. So what went wrong? Here, I'm telling her at my first Bible study, I'm telling her Bible truth. And yet I'm telling her that it's something so foreign to something she's ever heard. When she knows that all the Christians believe that when you go to hell, you're going to burn forever and ever. She thinks like, where did this guy come from? Like, I just completely lost credibility with her. And so through this experience, I learned a big lesson. Don't start with any Bible study that discredits or disagrees with what they already believe. Okay, then what would be a good Bible study to start with? What would you start with? What's a topic that wouldn't disagree with whatever they already believe? And you guys, start chatting away in the chat box. Don't be afraid, okay? We're here to learn. So put in, put in the top. Okay, someone put Happy Sabbath. Is that the topic? Nope. You wouldn't want to do you wouldn't want to do Sabbath as your first topic, right? Okay. So someone put salvation through Christ. Okay. That's a good topic. Salvation through Christ. Jesus loves them. Grace. Okay. I'm getting I'm getting good answers. And these are the typical answers that I get whenever I present on this topic. All right. Now, 
Let me tell you what, this quote is not from Sister White, but it's a beautiful quote. It says, we do not draw people to Christ by loudly discrediting what they believe, by telling them how wrong they are and how right we are, but by showing them a light that is so lovely that they want with all their hearts to know the source of it. Isn't that beautiful? Because see, we as Seventh-day Adventists, we sometimes think we're just kind of like uh, the Jews, the, the Pharisees. We have a monopoly on the truth. We know what's right. You don't. And we want to tell you. We want to set you straight. And you know what? That doesn't work at all because we have to win their confidence. Ellen White says, agree with the people on every point where you can consistently do so. Let them see that you love their souls and want to be in harmony with them so far as possible. So we have here two people who put down Jesus' death and resurrection and salvation through Christ. The majority of people that I give Bible studies to are already Christians. So they're already familiar with justification by faith. They're already aware of this. Don't forget, first impressions is most important thing. You have one shot. How do you know if you had a successful Bible study? I picked this. Up, I picked up this tip from my my buddy who used to work at work for Amway. I'm not I'm not into Amway or multi level marketing, but but you know they they teach you a lot of stuff on how to be successful. And the thing is, you know you're successful in Amway when you can schedule them for a second meeting. And I was like, oh, I think I can apply that to evangelism. I think my Bible study is successful if I can get them to come back for Bible study number two. Because if they don't come back, that's it. So I do not do Jesus' death and resurrection or salvation because most of them, they already know this. I'm not, gonna sh I'm not showing them anything new that makes them go, wow, I want to come back for another Bible study with Dr. Kim. Okay? Another typical response that I get is the love of God. And someone wrote, Jesus loves them. Let's do the love of God. Okay. Love of God. That's a great topic. First John 4, 8, God is love. First Corinthians 13, the love chapter we can talk about. You know, he has loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, he has drawn thee. Let's talk about God's love. Okay. Why would God's, my God's love be better than your God's love? Why is the God of, why is the love of my God more profound or more uh, compelling? Then, you know, Vishnu's love or Buddha's love or some other. I mean, you know what I'm saying? So, so to me, to, to me, I don't, I don't, I don't start with that one. Although I know some people will start with that one. Okay. To me, I want to start with the most compelling topic that might get them to be like, wow, I want to come back for more. Someone said, when they see Bible confirm what they already believe, things in creation, prophecy. Okay. Love it. Lots of great answers coming through here. All right. So, so Kevin, Kevin yeah. would you suggest then finding, um, are you suggesting finding a common ground to nope. start on? Well, yes and no. I'm going to actually tell you what I'm going to, what I, what my go-to is. Okay. okay. Now, now, before I tell you, you have to recognize that Satan is so good at counterfeiting and hijacking God's truth. You know, Satan has a counterfeit for every single truth in the Bible. I mean, let's just start from the beginning. God gives us Sabbath. Satan hijacks that. He's got Sunday worship. God gives us marriage, institutes marriage at the beginning. Now look at what we got. What's marriage? I mean, people are marrying anything they want to marry. I mean, every truth. Look at the articles of furniture in the sanctuary. If you listen to Pastor Meyer's blueprint, every article has been, has been counterfeited or hijacked. So... So this is, this, is, this is Satan's MO. So the thing is, what happens when you start doing a Bible study, let's just take a Baptist. We have certain things in common with Baptists. They believe in baptism by immersion. They believe, they believe in justification by faith. But aside from a few things, everything that they believe is not true. They're waiting for the rapture. Some Baptists today, now they're even speaking in tongues now. They're waiting. Um, they believe in eternal torment. They worship on Sunday. So the thing is, what happens when you start doing a Bible study, you're going to start discovering you are flipping their worldview completely upside down. They're discovering that almost everything that they believed is a lie. That's not easy. Gigi, imagine if I tell you, you know what, your daddy, he's not really your biological dad. Oh, and by the way, you have a twin sister. You were separated from birth. Did you know that? Oh, and Gigi, by the way, you're really Chinese. 
I mean, you, you, you know what I'm saying? You, we have to be cognizant that we're flipping their worldview upside down, so we need to win their confidence. So what do you start with? Well, what do most evangelists start with when they do an evangelistic series at your church? There are two topics they usually will start with, one or the other. What are they? All right, good job, Nia. Nia and Rayan put in prophecy. Nia put in Daniel 2. Most evangelists will start with either Daniel 2 or they're going to start with why the Bible can be trusted. Those are the two topics. Now, they're both good topics, but between the two topics, I believe that Daniel 2 is a much better topic. And I'm going to share why I believe that later on in this presentation. Okay? What you're doing with Daniel 2 is you're showing a very simple, basic Bible prophecy where God tells the future for the next 2,600 years what's going to happen. Pinpoint accuracy. And when you're done, I've asked my Bible study contacts, what did you think? And I've had them literally say, amazing. I want my Bible study contact to leave my first Bible study amazed. Not like, yeah, 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 I've heard that all before. Does that make sense? Now, I can do the study on why the Bible can be, can be trusted archaeologically, scientifically, from just, you know, all the, all the different reasons. But I don't find it to be super compelling and super exciting. Not in the TikTok, Instagram world that we live in where people have a very short attention span. So what I do is I might be inclined to give that study guide. Amazing Facts has a good one. That's their first one, why the Bible can be, can be trusted. I will hand that to them or send them a link so they can look at that on their own. But I don't need to spend 45 minutes of their time because people are busy going through why the Bible can be trusted because most of them, they already trust the Bible. They're here for a Bible study to give me a chance and I want to make it the most compelling Bible study I can. I'm going to come back to this, but I'm going to go on. What's another topic that would not disagree with what they believe? It would not discredit what they believe. It would not make me lose their trust or decrease their confidence in me. A topic I love to do for the second one is the origin of sin and Satan. Where did Satan come from? You know, your average Christian has no idea. What we know in Ezekiel 28, Isaiah 14, Revelation 12, war in heaven, your average Christian knows nothing about this. So when you share about this, the origin of sin and Lucifer, they're like, wow, this is really fascinating. Because you and I have the inside scoop on the great controversy. Your average Christian does not understand uh, the cosmic conflict that you and I are aware of. So when I do this, now they're like, wow, this guy really knows the Bible. Okay, You're, are you following me? So those are two topics that I like to start with. A third topic that I like to do, if you know Pastor Myers, you should be familiar with the blueprint. Now, mine is, a, mine is a blueprint off of his blueprint, but it's a pretty simplified blueprint. But, you know, once you start going through the sanctuary and you start showing how everything is counterfeited, it's like, oh, wow. You know what I mean? So that's another topic that's not going to disagree. Because how many churches teach the sanctuary? We're the only ones. Sure, we teach the state of the dead, so does the Jehovah's Witnesses. And we share certain beliefs with other religions, but the sanctuary message, the only ones that teach that is us. So now here, those are just examples of three topics that we've covered that does not disagree with what they believe. And hopefully, now they're going to like, I want to come learn more. And now I can start introducing some of the more difficult topics for them to digest. Some of the more, like what we would call the testing truths. Now. Calvin. Yes. Um, so on YouTube, we've been seeing um, a few questions about the nature of God. What is God? Um, is he spirit? Is he this? Is he that? Would that be something you would address head on in a Bible study? Or would you kind of suggest sidestepping it? I would sidestep it. Now, it's really easy to sidestep stuff. When someone asks me a question, I go, you know what? You know what? We'll get to that in a further, in a further study. And usually they just let it go. Yep. So now, if you're new to giving Bible studies and you don't know where to start, the simple thing is just follow a study guide. It is written, has great Bible studies. Um, there's, there's so many great Bible study guides out there. Now, someone told me that one well-known evangelist says, you need to always stick with the order. Now, from my personal experience, 
this I just okay keep in mind um I'm just I'm not a theologian I'm just a beggar sharing with other beggars I'm going to just give you my personal perspective okay um I would say I would say if you don't know what you're doing stick to the order just follow a study guide okay it's the safest thing because with certain things certain topics should be covered before certain topics like for example uh you should cover state of the dead before you cover hell fire um you should cover the law before you cover the sabbath so there are certain things that are basic but there is no specific order that everyone has to follow and the reason why i can back that up is if you compare two bible study guides together they're not both in the same order do you know what i'm saying some study guides will cover certain topics at certain areas because if that was true that you have to stick with a certain order then every bible study guide produced by seventh Adventists would follow the exact same order but that's not the case are you following me but there are certain things in general for example when we talk about diet and health that's definitely not what i'm going to cover in the first or second and sometimes i'll get that suggestion i would cover health i'm like i wouldn't the last thing you want to do is tell somebody that they can't eat their pepperoni pizza on the first bible study and they need to stop drinking whatever they're drinking you know what i'm saying that's something you do at the end so for sure it's certain things but then the more you do bible studies the more you're going to start figuring out what you want to study what's important and what is important but you should cover later on down the road now rule number two you keep your bible studies to less than an hour and then kick them out all right now what's going to happen is the first bible study they had such a good time they want to sit and chat with you for two to three hours and when you invite them the next time to come back they forget that they wanted to stay on their own volition all they remember is that you kept them hostage for two to three hours and nobody wants to go back to someone's house where they're stuck for two to three hours because we're busy so when you go to a fine dining restaurant you know what they do they control the portions what happens when you go to a buffet how do you feel like after a buffet do you ever want to come back to that buffet you never want to come back for a while until you erase those memories it's the same thing with the bible study ideally 50 minutes or less and i'm kicking them out the door you want them wanting more it's like a sermon you want to quit while they're still wanting more you don't want to quit when they when they're like wishing you would just stop you know what i mean now if you're a gifted preacher like pastor Ivor, he can go on for an hour and a half and you want more but most not all pastors have that gift and so when you give a bible study for the first three minimum you kick them out the door now after you've been given bible studies for two months and you become friends and they want to sit and chat for two hours that's fine but you have to set that precedence and i can't tell you how important that is how do i present bible studies you know none of us liked covid but there was one huge blessing that came out of covid which is zoom because of covid now everybody knows how to use zoom before i used to do bible studies sitting at my desk with my patient next to me or whoever i'm giving my bible study to, with the study guide or with my bible not anymore i do it all on the computer if they're sitting next to me gg pretend you're sitting next to me i have my bible pulled up right on my computer screen i may have my bible study guides i can find things on google images just like that it's so quick i don't have time to flip through pages looking for stuff and they can highlight it they can see it i'm turning 50 in a week and a half now and at my age i have to have readers to see and so on the computer it's all blown up and then because of this now i don't do so many bible studies sitting next to my patient anymore it's too easy to do it on zoom they don't need to spend 15 minutes to drive to my office 15 minutes to drive back it's so convenient tonight i got a bible study at 7 30. it's on zoom and zoom you can do this with somebody who's living in europe and so and with share screen they can see everything on your screen so that's one of the blessings that came out of covid now you want to make your bible studies as much as possible interesting and compelling and you may be like well i don't know how to give a bible study at least be enthusiastic and excited about your bible study who wants to who wants to be in a bible study when you look like you're bored now do you get excited about your favorite restaurant how about who won the championships how about your last vacation your new house we all know how to get excited about things that we're passionate about now the scottish philosopher and skeptic david hume was recognized amongst the crowd of people listening to george whitfield the famed evangelist so imagine a huge crowd who's listening to a popular evangelist and you see this guy who's like an atheist a skeptic in the crowd listening to and a non and someone who was listening says to him 
I thought you didn't believe in the gospel. And Hume replied, I do not. But then he nodded towards Whitfield. He goes, there is something irresistible about a life lived with conviction and sincerity. When you're passionate about something, it's contagious. So be passionate, be excited. I mean, we are sharing the best news there's ever been. It's the greatest news there ever is. It's better than handing somebody a lottery ticket for $10 million. I mean, this is something that's priceless. And so if you're passionate, they're going to catch on to that passion. Um, Ellen White says, thousands, she says, thousands can be reached in the most simple and humble way. The most intellectual, those who are looked upon as the world's most gifted men and women are often refreshed by the simple words of one who loves God and who can speak of that love as naturally as the worldling speaks of the things that interest him most deeply. I love it because I'm not an intellect. I'm, I, I, I'm not a theologian, but yet I can share about Jesus and hopefully it's contagious and others get excited. Make your contact feel smart, not dumb. Here's an easy way to make someone feel dumb. Ask them a question and don't give the answer and wait for them to answer and they will feel dumb very quickly. When I give a question, I give the answer right away. So they're not sitting because it's stressful because you know the answer, so it's easy. But imagine when someone asks you a question and you don't wanna sound dumb and you're racking your brain and then your brain shuts down. So make them feel smart. And when they get an answer, affirm them. Say, that's right, excellent, you got it. Make them feel smart, okay? Don't make them feel dumb. Every chance I get when I'm given a Bible study, I want to lift up and highlight the love, beauty, and power of Jesus. And every chance I get, I want to show, I want to discredit Satan and show that he is the father of lies, why he cannot be trusted, why everything he does is counterfeited, and how he hijacks everything. I want to do this because as we start getting into the testing truths, and I'm showing how Satan has completely taken these truths and falsified Bible truths. I want to already condition their minds to see, oh, yeah, it should be no surprise. It's what Satan does. You know what I mean, from the beginning, his first lie, you surely you shall not surely die. I mean, that's all he does. And so you want to get them, you want to do this, okay? With each of my contacts, I want to establish a friendship with them because I truly believe the only evangelism that truly works best is friendship evangelism. So they're not just a number. When they come, I ask them, how is it going? How's your day? Talk to them. You know what I mean? And, and develop a relationship. Ellen White says, your success will not depend so much upon your knowledge and accomplishments. That's great because I know more about dentistry than I know about soul winning. She says, as upon your ability to find your way to the heart. By being social and coming close to the people, you may turn the current of their thoughts more readily than by the most able discourse from gospel workers. We already talked about this in the first session of No Greater Bliss, right? What are they passionate about? Are they excited about gardening? Talk about gardening. Are they excited about paddleboarding? Talk about paddleboarding. Talk about things. Build that connection. Build that relationship so that you have a connection with them. Uh, let them talk about themselves. People love when you ask questions about them and they can talk about themselves. Now, when it comes to Bible studies, leave the timing to God. To me, I, my brother is an, is an evangelist with amazing facts. My best friend was an evangelist with amazing facts. So I understand the, the whole evangelism culture. I'm all for evangelism and they work. They work. The only challenge is, is that man in four weeks, you got to give up your pepperoni, give up your Starbucks, give up this, give up that, give up your day of worship. It's not easy. You know what I'm saying? And just so you know, when you give one-on-one -on -one Bible studies, it doesn't happen like it happens like an evangelistic series. And four weeks later, boom, they're getting baptized. It's taken some of my contacts. When, when, I ha when things go smoothly, probably four, four or five months before they're baptized. I've had some people, it's taken over a year. You know what I mean? So the thing is, remember, Paul says, I planted, Apollos watered. Who gives the increase? God gives the increase. So make sure you leave the timing to him. Now, where is the power of giving Bible studies? It begins with prayer. You got to be praying for your contacts. Pray in the morning. Pray every. I'm praying for my Bible study contacts almost every day. They're on my prayer list. I'm praying that God is preparing the soil of their heart. And so make sure prayer, I cannot underscore um, 
And so, you know, when if I have someone like one guy, I every time I meet with him on that day, I just fast because he was an atheist. So I just fast just for 24 hours, about 23, 24 hours, just for one day, just water um, and fasting from social media because I wanted, I need Holy Spirit power. So um, can't, um, cannot say enough things about prayer and fasting. And, you know, some of the neatest experience of giving the Bible studies is just at that right moment when you need what to share. God gives you the Bible text, the illustration, the story just comes to your mind. And you know that God is giving you just what you need that's perfectly adapted for that situation. And talk about a spiritual high. Now, how to deal with the most common fear of giving Bible studies? So one of the most common fears is that they might ask me a question I don't know how to answer. I don't know how to give a Bible study. I don't know. So I'm going to tell you how easy it is. I already shared with you earlier. If they ask me a question and I don't know the answer, I go, you know what? We'll cover that in the future. A lot of times, you know what I just tell them? You know what? I don't know. Let me study this out and get back to you. Now, when you take that approach, is that a I know everything approach or is that a humble approach? It's a very humble approach. You might think, well, if I tell them I don't know, I'm going to lose credibility. No, you know what you're going to do? You're going to win their trust. Do you like a know-it-all or do you prefer somebody who's really actually just human and says, you know, I don't know everything, but let me study it out. And so it's so simple. If you don't know, you can say, you know, I don't know, but let me get back to you. Let me look into that. Or let's do it in the future. Okay. Now, one time I was at the airport and I think I called my Bible study contact for some reason. I'm sitting there and he goes, can I patch my aunt through right now? Can I patch her through? And, and I'm like, sure. And he goes, you know, we, you know, we had, we had, I forget if me and him had studied or we had already studied about <coughs> why Michael is Jesus. Michael is not just an angel. We as Seventh-day Adventists teach that Michael is Jesus. Your typical Christian, they all believe that Michael is an angel. It's not Jesus. I still don't know why it's such a big deal, but it's a really big deal to them. It's a big deal. And right there, she asks me about what it says in Jude, a verse about Michael. And right there, I don't know the answer. Do you know what I do anytime? I'm conditioned to do this. Anytime my Bible study contact asks me a question, as they're asking me a question, do you know what I do most of the time? I'm always praying. As soon as you start asking me a question, my, uh, my default is, Lord, please give me an answer. Please show me what to say. I don't even know what the question is. I'm going to start doing that because I need, you know, I need to, I need to unite my weakness with God's divine power. And as she's asking me this, and I'm saying, Lord, please show me what to do. The loudspeaker says, everyone needs to board the plane. I was like, perfect. I said, you know what? I'm at the airport and I've got to board the plane right now, but let me send you something quickly on my phone. I typed in Amazing Facts, uh, Amazing Facts, their website, and they have a, a booklet that I'm familiar with. It explains exactly why Michael is Jesus. So I copied the link and texted it to them, said, check this out, and then we can get back to, we can get back on this. Then as soon as I got on the airplane, I pulled up that link and I reread it. And it's very easy. It's a very, it's, it's so simple to prove from the Bible that Michael is Jesus, but I needed a refresher. And once I went through it, I was completely refreshed and reminded. But this is just one example of I was saved by the bell. So the thing is, God will deliver you, but get in the habit of when they ask you a question, just ask God to, to guide you and, and show you what to say. So sometimes it might be, we'll study that in the future. Sometimes it might be like, you know, I don't really know, but let me look into it. Or sometimes, just like this, God provided, and boom, I gave them a link that has better answers than I could give them. Okay? Now, one thing I, I wanted to mention well okay i'm gonna go back now and i shared why i like why daniel 2 is my favorite go-to for my first bible study you guys daniel 2 is so easy to give you don't even need a bible study guide now i'm going to tell you what i normally do i start with isaiah 46 9 and 10 and basically it says in isaiah 46 9 um let me just let's just Go there real quick, okay? Forty-six. 
Okay. Okay. It says, remember the former things of old, for I am God, there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me. At this time, they worshipped all kinds of different foreign gods. And God is just making a bold claim that I am God. I'm the true God. There's none else. And then in the next verse, he says, I can tell you the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things that are not yet done. God just makes a simple claim that, look, I can tell you the future. The history books can tell us what happened in the past. Social media can tell you what's happening right now. But none of us can tell anybody what's going to happen even tomorrow. God is making a bold claim. I can tell you things that are not yet done. And then right after that, you go to Daniel 2. Okay? Now, I'm going to give you guys a, just a short little Bible study, although you guys already know Daniel 2. In Daniel 2, the king has a dream. God gives him a dream. Why did God give the king this dream? Any answers? Tell me what you, why you think God gave the king this dream. Okay? God, I'm going to just tell you for the sake of time. God gave the king this dream. The simple answer is because God wanted to reveal himself to the king. Now, not only did he want to reveal himself to the king, God wanted to reveal himself to all the wise men. Not just the wise men, all of the people in the Babylonian kingdom. The real answer is not only them. That's right, Sister Cindy. God wanted to reveal himself to everyone. You want to reveal yourself to the world? You're going to start with the, somebody who nobody knows? Somebody, some country bumpkin that nobody knows or some homeless guy? Or does it make sense maybe to start with the most powerful man of the then known world, which is King Nebuchadnezzar? So God starts with King Nebuchadnezzar because how long do you think it took for the news to spread? in a time without internet, cell phones, social media, that, you know what? All the wise men are going to die. I Within probably 30 minutes, the whole kingdom probably heard about it. Gossip travels pretty fast. So God reveals this dream to the king to reveal himself to the world. Why did God hide the dream? Any answers? Why did, because remember, the king couldn't remember the dream. You guys all know the story. Why did God hide the dream? God, okay, someone put to prove himself, it's connected to that, okay? I'm going to give you the simple answer, okay? Ooh, you guys are on the right track. The simple answer is God hid it to protect his prophecy because remember what the wise men said? You tell us a dream, we'll give you the interpretation. They would have given a false interpretation. What's that called? It's called a false prophecy. God was protecting his truth, okay? Right? In Revelation, we have the false prophet, and we want true prophecy. So God was protecting this, all right? Now, Daniel, young man, probably 20 years old. Right now, he's about to be put on the chopping block. And he goes, I will go speak with the king. How does this young man have that kind of courage and the audacity to say, let me speak with the king. Now, don't forget this, okay? I heard, I heard someone doing an evangelism series say this. I never forgot it. If you have knelt before God, you can stand before kings. Who is man that you and I should be fearful? And so often we're afraid to give Bible studies because we're afraid of man. If you've knelt before God, you can stand before kings and emperors, monarchs and magistrates, governors and judges. So anytime you feel any kind of trepidation, anxiety or fear to go speak to any mortal man, just remind yourself, all of us, we should be kneeling before God every morning, right? And so if you've knelt before God, you can stand before kings. And so for Daniel to go stand before this king, there was no fear or hesitation there. It was an easy thing. Now, Daniel, he goes and tells the king, I can tell you this dream. How did Daniel know that he could tell the king his dream? How did he know? Can you think of another story in the Bible where somebody told the king a dream that he dreamed? 
Do you think Daniel was familiar with the Old Testament? That's right. Diane and Kennedy, Joseph. You remember King Pharaoh had a dream and Joseph was able to interpret the dream. So Joseph, know, see, uh, Daniel, he knows the Bible. So he knows, and this is what faith is. Faith is knowing that God can do for you what he has done for others in the Bible. However, there is something, something different about this story with King Nebuchadnezzar and the story of Joseph. What is the difference? There's one thing, one little factor that's different between King Nebuchadnezzar's dream and Pharaoh's dream. Pharaoh could remember his dream. King Nebuchadnezzar cannot remember the dream. So how did Joseph know that he could tell the king this dream, even though he didn't know what the dream was? And I heard an, someone doing an evangelism series share this, and I loved it. I thought it was so beautiful. This is what real faith is. Real faith is knowing that God can do for you things that you've never seen God do for anybody before. And that's what Joseph had. That's what, I'm sorry, that's what Daniel had. Daniel had real faith. So anyways, uh, to wrap this up, as you guys know the story, Daniel and his three friends, they pray. He's able to go before the king and tell the king the dream and the interpretation, which are the two things that the king wanted. And who does the king end up praising? He said, blessed be the God of who? Daniel. Who alone could interpret this dream? None of the wise men. None of those people could do it. Only God's children could interpret this dream. And because of that, Daniel's God was praised. Now, 2,600 years later, who alone can properly interpret this dream? I'm gonna, I, say this, I say this loosely. It's us Seventh-day Adventists, God's children, who can properly interpret this dream. Now, once in a while, I will come across somebody who already understands the interpretation of this, okay? That's not a Seventh-day Adventist. But I have never met anyone who could tell me what Daniel 7 uh, and uh, explain Daniel 7. They can't. They might understand Daniel Daniel 2, but I have personally haven't run into anyone that's, that is not a Seventh-day Adventist that can explain Daniel 7 and then go on to Revelation 13 and explain it the way we can explain it. So my point is this. To me, if this was God's chosen method of revealing himself to the world, and it's good enough for God, I think it's good enough for me. That's the reason why I like to use Daniel 2 98% of the time for my first Bible study. Think about this. In less than 150 words, God gives an outline of the history of the world for the next 2,600 years. You and I can't even predict what's going to happen in six days. We can't even predict what's going to happen in one hour. And here God gives a sweeping overview of the next, and it's accurate, incredible. God says there will be Babylon. There was Babylon. God says there will be Medo-Persia. There was Medo-Persia. There will be a third kingdom. Okay. Greece, there will be a fourth kingdom. Rome. Number five, Rome will be divided from within. Number six, Rome would stay divided despite efforts to unite Europe. And number seven, God would set up a kingdom that will last forever. All six things have happened. And we can look at history to see that it's happened exactly the way it was foretold. What are the chances that we can trust that number seven will happen? Okay. Now I'm just giving you, now the things that I just shared with you right now, I'm not sharing that with them when I give a Bible study. I'm giving a regular Daniel 2 Bible study. But my point, what I'm trying to underscore is that this is why to me, Daniel 2 is one of the best Bible studies to give, in my personal opinion. And of course, um, you know, the Bible says, let every man be convinced in his own mind. Okay, so this is my personal opinion. But the bottom line is, if, it, if, if this was God's method, it's good enough for me. I don't need to reinvent the wheel. But from my own experience, it works. It works so well. And they walk away and they go, wow, I want to know more kind of a thing. So now let me go back. And I want to... Um,
Sister White tells us the secret of success is a union of divine power with human effort. So make sure that, you know, you are uniting with God's divine power or there will be no power in your Bible study. I'm going to just highlight something real quick. A qu common question I get is, how do you get Bible studies? Well, the first step in common denominator is prayer. In the mornings, each morning, I ask God. I try. There might be a morning I forget, but usually most mornings I ask God for divine appointments. I'm asking God to allow my path to cross with people who are searching for truth. Aside from, aside from that, no two situations are alike. Every situation is different. The Bible tells us in Ecclesiastes 11, 1, cast your bread upon the waters. What does bread represent in the Bible? It's the word of God. There's many things that represent the word of God. What are things that represent the word of God in the Bible? Put them in the chat, guys. I know you guys are Bible students. The seed represents the word of God. Meat, milk, sword, the lamp, manna, water. Oh, yeah, your church is called living manna. Um, all these things represent the word of God. It says cast your bread. Bread represents the word of God. Cast your bread upon the waters. What does waters represent in Bible prophecy? People, multitudes. We're to cast it. I mean, if you're a fisherman, do the fish just jump into your lap when you're sitting on the shore? Or do you have to cast a line? You got to cast that line. And the more you cast that line, the better your chances are that you're going to catch a fish. And so the Bible tells us, um, the bottom line is you got to ask people if they want Bible studies. Desire of Ages tells us many are waiting to be personally addressed in the very family, the neighborhood, the town where we live. There is work for us to do as missionaries for Christ. They're all around us, people who are looking. And when I pray, I'm asking God for him to just orchestrate for our path to cross because I'm willing to give it. Um, you got to be intentional and deliberate. John chapter 4, out of that whole chapter where Jesus meets the woman at the well, my favorite verse is verse 4, and it says, and he must needs go to Samaria. It's just a simple verse, but it's so full of intentionality and being deliberate. Jesus had, a, he was on a mission. He had a divine appointment, and he goes, and he must needs go to Samaria. And you want Bible study context? We have to be intentional and deliberate about these things. Now, I know it can be intimidating to ask someone if they want Bible studies. I might have shared this before when my patient texted me. One of the best text messages I ever got. Hey, I just want to let you know how thankful I am for you. I said yes to a Bible study and it changed my life. Thank you. What if I hadn't asked him if he wanted Bible studies? I would have missed the opportunity to help change his life. 25-year-old male patient. But I want to underscore, remember, do not ask people if they want Bible studies if you haven't won their confidence first. Remember, Jesus won their confidence, then he bade them follow me. So the timing is important. So make sure you've developed a relationship and the timing is right and ask God to guide you. You don't just go up to people you just met. Like, hey, do you want a Bible study? And, you know, that's that's one good way to build a wall with people. In so, uh -huh. Calvin, um, in an online environment, right, because um, we're an online church, and so – if we had people who were watching pastors videos or shorts and commenting on them or having questions and the people here um, who are interested in evangelizing were to be intentional and go through those comments and look for them. What are some, what are some, if you could cover it maybe later, I don't want to interrupt your flow, but um, what are some things that they could do to turn those in, you know, cause they're not going to get a lot of chance to build trust, but what are some steps that we could do in an online environment in that situation to implement some of the stuff you're talking about and turn that into a, a Bible study or at least a contact? Such a great question. This situation is different because they already know it's a church. You know what I mean? They're not coming into your place of business. They're looking to get a haircut and you're like, hey, do you want Bible studies? They're already, they, they, you know, these people are, they might not be, they, they might be more closer on the continuum of being low hanging fruit. Like they're, they're spiritually inclined. They're interested. So I would just begin with dialogue. Like, that's a great question. Da, 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 da. Check out this link. And if, if I feel like I can connect with them, I'd be like, hey, would you be interested in doing a Bible study? I'd love to give you a Bible study. In, in that case, absolutely, I'd say go for it because they're already on your site and they already know it's a church. Awesome. Thank you. Totally. Absolutely. Um, so, you know, in real estate, it's all about location, location, location. And soul winning, connection, connection, connection. 
connect with the people. You know, now if they're asking questions, the first thing I wouldn't say is, hey, do you want a Bible study? I mean, I, I just, I would just dialogue just at least a few times. Hey, that's a great question. Da, da, da. Hey, where do you live? Blah, blah, blah. Oh, you know, and just try to develop some kind of rapport and then be like, you know, one of my favorite things to do is I really enjoy giving Bible studies and I'd love to share it with you if you're interested, you know, versus a, versus a first thing I say is, do you want Bible studies? Right, you know I mean? right, right. Yep. Um, so. Using using soft like Sister Tante teaches us this in relationships, but even in in in, the, in this type of scenario, using soft starts like even if they're saying something contrary, like well, what makes you think that? Or start start some questions rather than just um, nothing will shut down like me is if I if someone just corrects me, and and, and I just kind of walk away with my tail between my legs or well, that's not even what I meant, you know. So. Soft starts are, are, are great, right? Huge. You look on Facebook and, and the comments that people put just appall me. People, Adventists are no different from the rest of the world when it comes to disagreeing and putting people down if they say something. I mean, it's crazy. You know, and me, I just scroll on by. If I don't have anything nice to say, I just don't say it at all. And, you know, and we kind of need to be that way, especially when we're trying to win souls, build bridges. We got to be winsome. So great question. Now, I'm going to, as I come to an end, I'm going to just share three reasons, three reasons of many reasons why I love giving Bible studies. Okay. One is it is so satisfying. Now there's only three things that I find truly satisfying. Okay. Pastor Ivor Myers and I, we love to exercise. We love to go to the gym and work out. I have never worked out and walked away and go, man, that was a waste of time. What was I doing? Now, I have spent time where I spent an hour looking at stupid stuff on social media. And I go, man, what a waste of time. I just feel like so unproductive. We've all been there. Like you start watching these little short videos and next thing you know, stupid videos, the car crashes and all this stuff. And you're like, oh, I just wasted 40 minutes. But I have never felt that way after an exercise or a run or a workout. Same thing. I've never walked out of a Bible study going, oh, that was a waste of time. No, you walk away and I just feel spiritually rejuvenated and energized. Number two, you struggle in studying the Bible. There is no better way to study the Bible than when you're learning it to teach it to somebody else. You will retain it and you will get insight. Even after I've given, I can't tell you how many Bible studies I've given on Daniel 7. I keep finding stuff in Daniel 7 I never saw before. I'm like, I've read this so many times. I never saw that before. So you want to know the Bible more? Teach it to others. In California, if you teach a class, uh, a continuing education class for the bar exam, you get three times the credit because they know when you teach it, you're going to learn it and inculcate that even more than the person who's learning it. And it's just like anything else, anything, whatever you do, piano, guitar, any activity, the more you do it, the better you get at it. And number three, we owe it to Jesus. I owe it to him. Jesus was willing to risk failure and eternal loss to come to save you and I. And you know what? It is a privilege and honor that we have to share. So as I come to an end, I'm going to just end with one last story. I always like to um, end with stories or something to inspire or encourage, okay? So years ago, my friend Paul was in Peru, and he was on a short-term mission trip. And, you know, he's out in this public area, and these, these little street urchins, kids begging for money. They're begging for money. And, you know, they're, these kids are taught how to beg. They're, they're like professional beggars, and they have adults usually coaching, guiding them, and some of them might be pressured to do this. Anyways, a little girl is begging my friend Paul for money, and my buddy Paul, he's a pretty sharp guy, sharp as a whip. And he's not going to fall for these little kids begging tri tricks. So he likes to say things to throw them off. So he says to the little girl, didn't your mom teach you not to beg? And the little girl replies right away, and she says, that she doesn't have a mother. And Paul thinks, oh, man, this girl is really good. Man, she's got an answer. Because these kids are taught exactly how to pull on the heartstrings of these American foreigners and tourists to get people to give them money. So Paul, he says to her, why don't you come to my house and you can live with me? Without missing a beat, the little girl replies, my mom told me before she died to never go home with a stranger. And Paul thinks, wow, this girl, she's got an answer. She's ready. And him and his friend, they start to laugh. And as he looked down at this little girl, 
she saw a tear start to well up in her eyes and her lips began to quiver. And as he looked at this little girl's face, his heart dropped at that moment because he realized that him and his friend were laughing at a little girl who had lost her mother and was homeless, living on the streets. Now, Paul felt relieved when he found out that this little girl has an older sister. Surely somebody's looking after this girl. At least she's being taken care of. He met her sister. She was only 10 years old, her older sister. And this girl is eight years old. These two girls living on the streets. Their mother had died of AIDS when she was just five and a half years old. They'd been living on the streets for over two years. To make a long story short, this was a defining moment in Paul's life. He bought a house in Peru during that trip. He moved in a Peruvian family that spoke English and who could take care of this little girl and her sister. This was the beginning of his orphanage in Peru. And Paul adopted those two little girls. Now, fast forward. One day, this 13-year-old girl shows up with a little baby and says to Paul, this girl I met told me, come to my father's house. Tell my dad your story. This 13-year-old girl shares that she got pregnant at 13 years of age. Her parents said, you're old enough to take care of yourself. You're old enough to have a baby. You're old enough to take care of yourself. So her and her boyfriend, they moved out and kind of headed off to the coastal town. Can you imagine at 13 trying to make a living and live? Her and her boyfriend, they couldn't make it. They struggled. So they came back and they moved in to the boyfriend's home, his mother's home. They were doing well there, but then her boyfriend started to beat her and the baby. So she had to run away. So she's a 13 year old with a baby living on the streets homeless. And she runs into this little girl, Martha. Now, Martha is the one I started with the story with, the, the one that was begging. She runs into Martha and Martha says, come to my father's house. Now, this is the essence of the gospel. Could you say the gospel in any simpler way than these five words? Come to my father's house. Martha herself had experienced being destitute. And my friend Paul had made a sacrifice to save these girls from the streets, which were rife with abuse, exploitation, human trafficking, trafficking and a myriad of danger. Martha had come to taste and see for herself the love and the, and the home that her new father had gave her. And all she did was tell someone else, come to my father's house. And you and I are just like that, Martha. As we have tasted and seen for ourselves how good our father is, we get that privilege of sharing with others and inviting them. And that's what we get that, and that's what we get to do we have that opportunity to share his truth with a world that is hurting and dying for a lack of truth. So anyways, it's always been a blessing um, to be on here. Thanks for having me. I saw a question. I'm going to just um, let yeah. me uh, respond to this question. There was a question, Diane put, which is an important question. She said, do you leave them to learn on their own after a while? Diane, here's one of my challenges. After I give them Bible studies. I, 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 let me tell you, this is really cool for anyone who is an elder. Not all pastors are aware of this, but if you are an elder, if you're an ordained elder, you can actually baptize someone you give Bible studies to. If your pastor gives you permission to me, I think that's really neat. You know why? If I'm the one who gave Bible studies for five months, it makes more sense that I baptize them than the pastor who may not even know who they are. So the local pastors that I work with, they allow me to baptize. It makes it much more special. Now, trust me, there are many pastors who don't know this, but all the conferences know this. So sometimes I'll get this where the pastor be like, well, let me check with the local conference just to make sure. And then they'll get back and be like, oh, absolutely. So I know this for a fact. But anyways, the challenges are, is that there are not a lot of young people in our churches these days. And our churches aren't the most friendly churches either. So what I do is with my my 
baptismal context, as long as they continue wanting to study, I continue to study the Bible with them. And the reason why is just to maintain that fellowship and friendship. Because you leave them to the local church, and unless they make good connections, they may not be at that church anymore. So that's something that's really important. I have one patient. He just could not really make any connections. And so I continue. We're, we're friends. We go out. We connect and do stuff. I've got another one. Every once in a while, he'll just come in for a Bible study. So as much as possible, you need to. You can't just be like, okay, Bible study done, you know. And sometimes that may happen. It's happened to me too because of geographic locations or whatever. Um, but as much as possible, you need to try to maintain that relationship, friendship. Let me see if there's any other questions in here. Anybody, if you have any questions, go ahead and put them in the chat box um, at the bottom. Otherwise, no questions, then what we'll do is we will end this. Now, I went... Normally, if you guys notice all my other previous messages, I've cut it short. I've cut it to right about an hour. Now I've gone this one longer than usual, but that's only because now I know you guys. So you, you know, you guys aren't thinking I'm keeping you hostage. So, but anyways, it's, it's long enough. So let's pray. And then we'll, we'll end this one. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, it's humbling to think that you would use defective and feeble people like us to be co-laborers with you in, in this most important and grand work of soul saving and that you give us this privilege because you want us to experience the joy in souls redeemed and soon when we are in heaven we will never have this opportunity ever again and so lord i pray that um you would help us to be faithful and i pray for divine appointments for each and every single person here and i pray that they would take up this challenge this year that that they would pray and ask lord that you would allow them to cross paths with someone that they can have that privilege of studying the bible with we thank you, Lord. We pray all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 Brother Kevin, when you do Bible study, do you um, have a preferred translation? Um, great that question. Great question. Um, that's a great question. I do not. I use a lot of different um, translations, but I'll tell you this. If you like to memorize scripture, my advice is memorize everything in one version. It drives me crazy. In my local school, my kids, when they were going to Adventist school, uh, the teacher had her memorize the first chapter of James in some children's edition. And I was like, have them memorize it in the New King James or King James because because when, when, when they're different translations, you know, you, you're storing this in your mind and you can carry it for the rest of your life. How much better to have a translation that's a, a solid, good translation? So for, for memorizing, stick to one translation. You don't want to memorize in all these different translations. But when Bible studies for me, my go-to is King James or New King James. That's just my personal preference. But I, I, I will use different translations for different stuff. I'm more likely to use different translations for sermons, but for Bible study, or I'll use whatever is on the Bible study guide. Now, now what I do is for Bible studies, there's a number of studies. I don't need a study guide. I just, I just basically freestyle it. All I need is I, I know the text. I know where I'm going. I can just flow. There are some studies that I might use a study guide to just kind of use as an outline to guide me and direct me. And, you know, sometimes I, I know a lot of the, where the texts are, but there's a lot of texts I don't know where they are. So I use that. But would you, say, would you say, would you say it's more important that, like, is it more important that you are comfortable with the translation or would you tailor it to who you were, um, who you were including in the Bible study? So for me, for example, I um, live in, in, I basically live in the hood. Um, and, and so forth, or, you know, people might ha not have a great grasp of the English language or academia, would, would going to the ERV or ESV then be appropriate? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Make it as simple. And that's the beauty of the gospel. It's, it's simple. You know what I mean? Okay. You know, it, it's, it doesn't have to be complicated. You don't have, you know, yeah. So absolutely make it as simple and palatable for them. Awesome. Uh, Beverly, Beverly says, do you recommend a set of guides to start with? I personally just started with Amazing Facts from years ago, and they have lots of great pictures, and they're fantastic. I know some people really like certain truth link is out there. There, That's really good. Um, there's another one, Simple Truth, I think it's called, that breaks things down really simple. And what, what you'll find is you'll start making your own study guides. You know, you start seeing this, you like this point, you like this point, and you'll start, you know, some of these... Bible studies I give, it's my own study guide that I've made. It's a hodgepodge, nothing new under the sun. I've just gotten different stuff from different evangelists, and it's all in there. 
a lot of the stuff that I'm sharing with you guys today is just stuff that I've learned along the way, either from my own mistakes or learning from other evangelists and stuff. And I was like, oh, that's a good story. Okay, I got to include that one. So. What about Harvest Time Books Bible Studies? I've never heard of it. I've never heard of it. But I haven't, I haven't, let's just put it this way. I haven't seen an Adventist Bible study guide that I didn't like. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Go through it. See how you like it. But it's got to be simple. That The beauty of Daniel 2 is that it's so easy and simple that a child can understand it. It's not complicated. And so anyone can explain it and teach it just by skimming through it and telling, highlighting the key points. So we have you back for one more week next week. So you guys. If you have oh, you know what? Next week, I, we're going to have to figure out a different date because just because next week I am out of town. And then the week after I'm speaking in Portland, Oregon, so I'm going to be over in Portland. So I just, and then the weekend after that, I am speaking somewhere else. So we just, we'll have right. to go into February, but we'll figure out a date that works. Okay. Uh, okay. Here's a good question. How important is it to be able to, to not make mistake? Diane, that's such a great question. And I'm going to quote David Ashrick, who had a whole sermon about this. The biggest mistake in soul winning is not making enough mistakes. Because you don't, if you're not making mistakes, it means you're not doing it. And how do, where am I sharing with you all the stuff that I'm teaching you from all the mistakes that I've made? Now, it's better to learn from someone else's mistakes. So it's okay. I have made mistakes that have burned bridges. Okay? I, I literally have. And, and I, I will continue to make mistakes. So it's okay to make mistakes. And God knows. And, you know, God is gracious. And we're, we're doing the best we can. But, you know, hopefully we learn from these mistakes. So, yep. We, I, we have all. We've made. I've made. I've made mistakes. Um, I, yeah, I, I, I'll just, I'll just be very vulnerable and share a mistake that I made just last week. I have a small prayer group that we pray together, and I shared a specific prayer request for some of my Bible study contacts because they're struggling with, with, um, and and I, nobody in the group knows who my friends are except one person did, and afterwards they messaged me and they're like, "Oh, I'd like to reach out to her," and I was like, "Sure." I'll send you her number. And then she texted this person and my Bible study contact was, did you say something? They did not like that. And I was like, oh, you know, this was something, you know, she's struggling in her personal life. And here I was just sharing it with the program. And I was like, I profusely apologized to her and she was gracious. I'm so thankful tonight. I said, hey, are you free tonight for Bible study? She is. We're going to study tonight in, an, uh, in, a, in about 30 minutes. You have no idea. I was like, I can't believe I made this rookie mistake. You know, and so, you know, my intentions were good. It's just like praying for my Bible study context. And then, you know, she's got personal issues going on. So, yeah, out is right. So we all make, we'll make those mistakes. Keep making them because if you're not making mistakes, then you're not doing anything. Is that, is that, will that be part of the last, the last thing maybe talk about um, confidentiality, personal identifiers? Is that part of this training at all? No, no, no. but <laughs> no, just, just, but I'm glad we're talking about it just because we have to just. And for me, it was just la just lack of thinking. It was just, you know, yeah. So, um, so Kennedy Kennedy is one of our, our um, younger, uh, much younger um, members. And she said, how do you give Bible studies when you have social anxiety? Oh, boy. You know, as soon as I read the question, what did I do? You guys, what did I do? I said, Lord, give me an answer. Um, you know what? I'm going to defer this one to Tante because she's going to have a better answer because she's a professional because, you know, I am super extroverted, as you guys know from one of the. So for me, I, I it's easy talking to people. I'm not nervous. I don't get embarrassed. So it's just it's easy. So so the, the, the honest truth, Kennedy, is I, I don't know what to say besides, you know, if, if it's someone that you're comfortable with, then you can just kind of go through a study guide and read question and answer. Um, but the thing is, here's another thing for me. When I am asked to speak at a church, I enjoy it. You know what's hard? When they ask me to do a TED Talk style talk. When you do a TED Talk, you've got to memorize the entire thing because no one goes up to do a TED Talk. I was nervous about this. Okay. So you know what I did? Because I'm going to be presenting. I'm going to be on the stage. I, re I just, all I did was I rehearsed it over and over and over and over like I'd never done before. And after you rehearse something about 10 times, I had the thing memorized. 
And when I went up there coupled with prayer, it was the strongest and best presentation I'd ever given, but it's because I had rehearsed so much that there was no fear. I went up there and I could just talk. Now I don't do that for any other sermons because I don't have time to sit there and rehearse and rehearse. Usually I've got my outline and notes, but I know for me personally, if I'm nervous, then what I do is going over the material and knowing it well may help, but I love it. Thank you, Atante. She said, let's talk Kennedy. So I'm sure she'll be able to give you. Uh, one of the things, um, one of the things that helps me Kennedy is um, cause people don't actually know that I do have some social anxiety um, having autism, but um, one of the things that helps me is practicing with a safe person. Um, somebody like your, your best friend or some, or just one person that you feel relatively safe with, you'll still, you'll still experience some anxiety, but if you can start with that one person and work through it, sometimes you can build up to two. Um, that work, that works for me. I love that you said that Gigi, you know why? When I said I rehearsed it, I didn't rehearse it in private. I did sometimes. I rehearsed it to my staff, to my friends, yeah. to my family. I wanted an audience. And you know, my with God. that, I'm nervous in front of my family. <laughs> and so, and it made all the difference. If you just do it by yourself, it's not the same. You got to do it in front of somebody. And so great comment, Gigi. So anyways, okay, it's almost going to be seven. So I'm going to let you guys go, seven my time. So I look forward to connecting you guys with you guys again for the last topic, which is really going to be about, um, I have to look at the topic Pastor Myers gave me, but it's how to start a ministry. And um, I'm hoping that it will inspire you because some of you may have ideas or some ministry that you may want to be a part of or you may want to start. And I had the, uh, the, the privilege of working with Pastor Ivor to start Army Bible Camp. Then after that, I took what I learned and I was able to start F5 Challenge. And then we started something else off of a Facebook group that's all about soul winning. And so I love starting stuff. And so I'm hoping I can share things that will maybe encourage you and help that so you guys can all start a ministry because truly the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. And it's very rewarding when you get to start and be a part of a ministry that's impacting the lives of other people. So, so you guys have, he, he just said he's going to take a break. Um, so you guys have your questions ready um, about ministries. Cause I know everybody here has got something in their mind, some seeds that God's planted, have those questions ready for him. Um, and, Everybody tell Calvin, since we won't see him next week, um, happy birthday. Happy, happy birthday. Um, if I could, if I could, I would wheel a wheelchair out um, to get a little past Meyer revenge there for you on your 50th birthday. But uh, we can't, we can't do that. But happy birthday. We all, we are all so blessed by this. We hope you have a very blessed birthday. Oh, praise God. Praise Lord. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Take care. Calvin, Calvin, yes, sir. Did, yes, sir. We, did we say something about a wheelchair? <laughs> yes, she, she said if she could, she'd uh, she'd pull out a wheelchair for me. So that uh, that means so. a lot to me. That means a thank lot. Thank you to me. so thank you so much, Gigi. You, I got you, Pastor. I thank you for you. saying that. I got you. I would wheel it right out. <laughs> I was forty. You pulled that out for me when I was forty, so, Calvin. Yeah. So for everyone who doesn't know what we're talking about, we were at we were doing an army Bible camp in Indiana, and it was Pastor Meyer's fortieth birthday. And so I went up there and I just said something that we've got some tragic, something tragic happened. And we just, we, you know, the audience just thinks something, like there's an emergency, like something horrible has happened. We've, we, you know, the board needs to convene. And then basically <laughs> we wheeled out a wheelchair for Pastor Myers because he was turning 40 years old. That was a tragic news and information. So well, Cal Calvin's turning 50. So I think we need to do, it, no wheelchair. We just need to get the stretcher. Two guys yes. dressed up in an EMP with cleat with the paddles. <laughs> <laughs> all right calvin too funny you guys take care night. good night everyone night okay. good night